I'm excited and honored to have Greg Dickerson uh, join me today. Uh, Greg is an investor. He's um, a mentor. He's a counselor, a speaker. He's heavily involved in this church. He's got a, quite a fascinating uh, resume. Greg, I appreciate you taking your time to join me today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Nathan, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, and you're based out of Virginia, correct? Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, I do deals all in the mostly in the southeast region from Florida up to northern Virginia. Uh, but yes, I, I live in Charlottesville. That's awesome. So what, what got you one into Charlottesville? Because I've lived there before. Um, there's, you know, there's quite a lot there, but it's kind of not a destination place, right, per se. Yeah, sure. well, I, you know, it's, it's becoming that way. I mean, we're, we're on the wine map, you know, so it's one of the wine capitals of the East Coast, definitely now. We are the Sonoma Valley East. Um, so there is there is a lot of traffic there, a lot of uh, distilleries, breweries, things like that popping up, the mountains, things like that. But uh, it's horse country, and uh, we have a daughter who uh, rides at the at the highest level. She wants to ride for the United States, the Olympics. You know, she's working towards that, and um, we ended up moving here to help her with her career and and things like that. And my kids grew up skiing here, so we lived on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I know you're familiar with that area. Um, Kitty Hawk Nag said I spent 14 years there so this was our second home uh, which is funny because everybody from here their second home is the Outer Banks right so <laughs> <laughs> yeah everybody most says what are you doing here you're on the Outer Banks you know yeah most people are trying to get to the beach right not leave yeah it. yeah so that's how we ended up here and it's and it's really gotten a hold of me I mean this is you know UVA country it's the home of Thomas Jefferson uh, which is interesting from a faith perspective a lot of people don't know but you know, Thomas Jefferson has his own version of the Bible. He basically took everything out of the Bible that was uh, supernatural. He took a lot of the miracles out of the Bible and changed it. And that's actually on display at Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson. So very unique area. You know, the campus of UVA over the last, I moved here in 2011. And I mean, I, I want to say there's a spiritual awakening going on on the campus. Uh, one of the largest chapters of Chi Alpha, which is a university uh, faith-based organization, one of the largest chapters in the country, they're all over the country, uh, uh, is, is out of UVA. Um, I mean, they get 800 college students out on Monday nights to their, uh, their worship services and their, their Monday night live, they call it. Um, unbelievable organization. Uh, a lot of people have heard of Crew, um, Campus Ministry and Fellowship of Christian Athletes, FCA, things like that. So there's a lot of, there's about eight Christian organizations on the campus of UVA. So we've really seen things come alive there in the last you know, probably 10, 10, 12 years. Why do you think that, what do you think is driving that faith-based initiative on, on college campuses? Any thoughts on that? You know, I think as a country, as a nation, there is a spiritual awakening right now. Um, you know, it's a very different world than it was 20, 30 years ago. Although, you know, you can go back to Socrates, right? And he talks about the youth of the world and, uh, yeah. and things. But, you know, I, I just think, God is calling his people, bottom line. I think, you know, God is calling his people. The Bible says that, you know, he, he is in everybody's heart. He will touch everybody's heart and he will call all of his children home, right? So uh, I think it's just the natural course of things. I think um, more young people are seeking, especially in this world of technology and instant gratification and, and on-demand everything. Um, I think people realize there's more and they're seeking. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a phenomenon, you know, because you lose a lot of kids, as you know, kids grow up in the church and, you know, Sunday school, youth group, things like that. Typically that 10th, 11th grade year, 12th grade year, right before they go into college is when you start to lose them. They start to fall away from their faith and, and step away from their faith. And, and, you know, statistically, you know, the numbers are pretty big. And then when they get into college, it's even more difficult. You're surrounded by a lot of college professors and, and factors. You know, I've heard stories at UVA, where people have walked in the classroom and the college professor says, you know, uh, how many of you, how many of you have faith and believe in God? And people raise their hands and they'll say, well, this year you're going to find out why that's wrong. And, and they just throw it out the door and they have an agenda. And, um, you know, so it's very interesting and, uh, you know, to be in a, in a, in a community that's a college, uh, community and to see, uh, things go the other way. And there's a lot of college professors that walk in the classroom in day one and say, I'm a Christian and you're in my class. So I'm going to share my faith with you and you don't have to believe what I believe, but this is how I operate. This is how I teach my classes. It's how I conduct myself. And you're going to hear biblical principles taught. And one of the most popular, you know, beloved uh, economy 
uh, professors there. Uh, that's how he starts every year off. He just walks in, expresses his faith, and a lot of kids come to faith in his class. So it's it's really uh, it's really an interesting thing. You know, and that and that there um, that point of you know you can tell people this is what Jesus did, right? He went in and he said, "This is what I believe. This is what I stand for." But if you don't agree with me or you don't, you know, you disagree with me, let's let's have a conversation about it. Right. And oh, Jesus usually about. answered those conversations and questions with questions. Right. And uh, and there's plenty of examples. And I tell you, the one thing I tell a lot of people, too, because a lot of people get turned off by Christians. Right. You know, and you, you sent me a sermon that you preached recently about some of the struggles that you had walking and living out your faith. Right. And And, you know, asking yourself, man you know, if this is how I represent Christ, is anybody going to look at me and say, I want some of that? And, you know, the one thing to always remember about Jesus is he never said, follow my people. Jesus said, follow me, right? And, you know, we all struggle. It's a daily struggle, you know, and, and those of us who want to live a life of faith, who profess faith and live our lives by biblical principles, you know, we're human and we're going to make mistakes. There was only one perfect being and he said, follow me. Yeah. He did not say, follow my people. So if you follow Christ, if you count on his word, which it's, you know, the Bible was true back then, the Bible is true today. And if you just follow Christ, like he asked you to do, then you, you just can't go wrong. And that, and that point there, you know, you, you've been in business, you've done, I think I saw $200 million worth of deals you've been involved with. Is that? Exactly. And I've got a hundred million in the pipeline right now, uh, development deals. And uh, so, yeah, you yeah, know, quite a bit, different things, all different classes of real estate. So as, as, a, as a person of faith and as a Christian, you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to, everyone makes mistakes. Right. And like you said, there's no perfect. Is there a time in your life where you've made that mistake and instead of going and being like, hey, guys, or hey, ladies, you know, I've made a mistake and, and this is something we need to do to make it right. Um, have you found that time when you didn't do that and how did things go? versus, hey, I made a mistake, Let's, let me work to make this right and how that went? Um, so you're talking about today, it's 10, 12, I'm on the East Coast. So, uh, <laughs> you know, is this today or are you talking about Just my to, whole career? <laughs> in, in, in your whole career, or, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can be, yeah. walk, that's a good point. You know, you, you can be walking with the Lord and have, you know, that great relationship, be on the solid rock. Yeah. And, well, you know, look, we're in a tough business, right? So I, I grew up as a builder, you know, in, in business. So I started my career in 1997. I started as a remodeling contractor and, and then moved into custom home building and spec houses and things like that. You know, building and real estate deals and even general real estate, if you're a broker, investor, whatever, you know, it's very difficult. You know, it's a very relational business. It's a very personal business. People get very emotional about, you know, real estate and about property. And when you're building, it, it's about, accountability and doing what you what you say you're going to do. And if anybody's ever been involved in the building process, you, you know how difficult it can be. You're managing a bunch of different personalities, a bunch of different people where you have an agreement that they're going to exchange something for money, you know, their time, their talent, something, right? And you expect them to do it. And things don't always go as we understand. And as you go along, you learn the lessons and how to mitigate a lot of that. But, you know, as a person of faith, you know, you have to hold yourself to a different standard when things do go wrong, right? Could be, you know, Jesus said, hey, you're going to have trouble in this life. You know, it's not going to all be roses. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have trials. And it's not so much the trials that we face. It's how we conduct ourselves through them and how we deal with others through them. Because again, you know, we're, we are relational be beings and it's all about relationships. And you know, when somebody doesn't do something they say they're going to do, then there's a problem. And there's a fine line between kindness and weakness, right? So as people of faith, you know, we are called to a lot of things. You know, if somebody cheats us, we're supposed to just walk away, right? We're supposed to just, okay, and just take it and walk away. If somebody asks for the shirt off your back, we're supposed to give it to them. You know, if somebody slaps you, you're supposed to turn the other cheek, right? And I mean, there is scripture from Jesus straight out of his mouth where he says, if somebody cheats you, walk away. If somebody owes you, forgive them. Now, he also says that if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive others. So, uh, you know, in our business, we can't always do that. If somebody doesn't do what they say they're going to do, and we are the fiduciary, we're the principal, and we're doing a project for somebody else, I'm building you a house, 
and your drywall contractor doesn't finish the job, I can't just walk away from that, right? I have to hold him accountable. I can't pay him till he does the job. Um, I can't let him get away with a, a less than, you know, uh, stand a less than adequate job or, or stellar job on your project, right? Because you've hired me to do something for you. So then I have to go out and I have to hold those people accountable. So you get in those difficult situations. And, you know, when I was younger, um, you know, I was, I was, you know, the scripture says, be slow to anger, right? And, and quick to forgive. And, you know, I had that the other way around. I, I felt like I was doing battle, that I was out there and I'm your, I'm your builder. I'm building your house. So I'm defending your territory, right? So I wasn't going to let anybody not do what they were supposed to do. And, you know, I would stand my ground and, and I'm a fighter, you know, I'm a survivor and I'm a fighter. So I had to work very hard, not physically, right? You know, I'm not talking about throwing fists. I'm just talking about, I was not going to let somebody get over on me. Right. More importantly, I'm not going to let somebody get over on you. So I would be more confrontational when I was younger uh, in those days. And it took a while for that edge to come off. And it was really when I decided to live out my faith, I didn't go to church when, when I was growing up. I wasn't raised in the faith. I came to faith on my own at a very young age with a friend of mine. And I knew Jesus and I read the Bible on my own, but I wasn't walking it, living it. And I didn't have that relationship, right? I knew I was saved and I believed in God and all that, but I wasn't incorporating biblical principles in my daily life where Jesus said, follow me. And when I decided to change that and I decided to embrace faith and to be a man of faith and to walk it out, everything changed. I mean, it really did. It, it, I wasn't one of those people where I had a crisis, you know, that brought me to faith. Everything in my life was perfect. I mean, I was, my business was, was growing. I was making a lot of money. You know, my family life was great. I was a leader in the community and involved in everything. I mean, my life was perfect. When I made the decision, I'm going to buy in. I'm going to believe this Bible word for word that it is the absolute truth. And I'm going to buy in. And that's when my spiritual journey began. And a lot of things about me changed where all of a sudden now I was more patient and I was more tolerant and I was able to forgive and I was able to be more calm in situations. And, and, you know, that's one of my gifts. I'm just really good with people. Right. And uh, that really helped to temper me to where I could read the scriptures. I could read the lessons and Proverbs and, you know, of course, in the gospels and things like that. And it really helped me in terms of how to deal with other people and how to be more relational with others, how to forgive others and, and things like that. And along the way, I've, I've had business situations where I've had, to, I've had two lawsuits in my career where uh, I sued uh, a party in a big real estate transaction, two different projects. And I mean, they were four or five million dollar deals where the seller, we had a contract, I'm the buyer. They tried to back out of the deal at the last minute and sell it to somebody else for more money. And, uh, you know, the Bible may call us to, to walk away from that situation, but I had partners, I was a fiduciary. So I had to stand my ground and I had to file suit and, you know, it took a couple of years and we won hands down because you can't do that. You enter a contract with somebody to sell, you have to sell uh, unless the buyer can't yeah. perform. You, you know, and there are scriptures about, you know, Matthew, go, go, go to the person, take another person, go to the church, you know, if, if they're a Christian. Right. There are scriptures that also talk about if they're not a Christian, you can treat them as a non-believer. And, you know, in a situation like that, you can go and sue someone and try to protect your, you know, personal guarantee, try to protect your partners, but you got to be careful that that, you know, bitterness, that the pride or something doesn't sneak in and change your relationship with the Lord. Right. And that was a uh, stressful process because I've never been to court before. I mean, this was, you know, midway through my career and never, never been involved in a lawsuit, never been to court, but I did know and understand that it is simply a, a tool to resolve a business dispute, right? And I knew what they were doing. They were rolling the dice. And, you know, worst case scenario is we still had to buy the property and give them $4 million. Uh, best case scenario was they kicked us out and sold it to somebody else for, you know, $6 million. And that was really the literally what happened. We had a contract to buy it for four. It was worth six. Somebody else found out about it and started offering them more money. This was when things were booming, you know, pre-2009 and property was doubling overnight. And uh, this was an oceanfront property on the beach. And, and uh, so, it, you know, it was, a, it was a business situation. Now, that didn't mean that I wasn't, when I got put on the stand, you know, I was very nervous. I'd never been in that position. We had a jury. I knew some of them, very small community, right? And uh, I told the truth. And, and, but the other side manufactured, you know, the facts because they didn't have a case. So they flat out lied. They flat out made stuff up and they tried to make us, you know, the three of us look like we were these evil people trying to take advantage of this poor old lady who was left a property by her husband, right? 
years ago. It was an oceanfront hotel that or, or that they had and ran for years and a hurricane destroyed it. So they collected the insurance money and, uh, and they sold it. So, you know, when they put the little old lady on the stand, you know, her attorney says, uh, so you guys are very sophisticated. You've sold property to Walmart, right? She's like, oh yeah. So like right then and there, all of this, you know, evil developer thing just fell away. So it's very hard not to take it personal and get riled up when people are accusing you. But the same token, look at what Jesus went through, right? He was urinated on, spit on, beaten, accused, everything. And what do you do time and time again? You know, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so when you think about things in the eternal perspective, I use, that's kind of, I use everything in terms of the eternal perspective, right? Everything that we have, everything that's in this world is temporal. It's on loan from God. It's all going to be gone. We're here just a, just a brief moment in time. And if you take infinity times infinity to the 10th power, right? And compare that to our life. I mean, it's a fraction of a second like yeah. that. So when you look at the things that we go through and the things that we cherish and the things that we get all riled up about, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they don't matter. Right. It's really not that important. Yeah. Um, so obviously we have to be, you know, prudent. We have to be, you know, uh, fiduciaries of what God has blessed us with. And we have to be responsible. There's the parable of the talent. So we're expected to be responsible for what God's blessed us with. But at the end of the day, the only thing we're taking out of this world with us is other souls. That's it. That's the only thing you can take from this world with you to the next life is somebody else's soul. That's what we should really be focused on. Yeah, those are good points because that is, I mean, when it really comes down to it, is it the money you have in your account or the size of your business or, you know, what titles in front of your name or is it what you've done for the Lord? Right. And it's really what you've done for the Lord. It is. And you can use a lot of those things for that, right? So, you know, when you have money and you have position, and you have a successful business, then you can use that influence for the greater good and to build the kingdom. And I know you do that day in and day out. And that's why you're on this podcast right now. And I think that's awesome. And I think we can do that. So there's no scripture, you know, very, uh, several of the people, you know, the heroes in scripture were very wealthy, right? And Jesus associated with them, just like he did the poor. And the point, and the point of all that is, is that whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're in the middle, it doesn't matter to God. You know, he sees us all as equal, no matter what. But if you have advantage and you have influence, then use it for, for uh, use it to call people to God, use it for the, for the kingdom and to build the kingdom. And uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, there is scripture that kind of supports that and says that's what we're supposed to do. And that's really, you know, kind of part of this handling life is, you know, hey, one, you're not alone. So if you're, if you're not going the right way, if you're on the wrong path, you're not the first one to go down that path. You won't be the last. And there's a lot of people right beside of you, in front of you, and behind you. So, you know, start talking to someone. Kind of the right. other side of it is as well, you know, folks like yourself that are, you know, in a position that, you know, we're all called to be ministers, not preachers, yeah. not pastors, you know, not evangelists, but everything you do today from the person you got your breakfast from, if you didn't eat at home, or if you did eat at home, you know, your wife and your kids, to the person that you see at the gas station, to the person that you bump into at the bank, to the people that are driving by. I mean, we're all called to be that, to show the love of Christ and share the gospel. And I, you know, I really try to hit home the, the point, you know, how can you show the love of Christ to someone if you're stressed out or if you're in conflict or your life is totally in chaos? Because I've been there. And when you're there, you're not in a good mood. Right. You might, and, find, you might find a good mood for a moment, but it doesn't right. last. And that's where you can show the love of Christ more so than any other time, right? So when your life's going great and everything's good, you know, that, that a lot of times is, is when people show the least amount of Christ in their life. Oftentimes, it's when you're going through that, that storm or that trial or that difficult time that the light shines greater than any other time that it ever has. So it can be a great opportunity. And I love that you pointed out the ministry, you know, right? A lot of people say, I want to go into ministry, meaning, you know, I want to quit my job and go to some foreign country and, or I want to be a missionary. Well, you know, we're, as you said, we're missionaries. Ministry starts at home. I mean, we're missionaries and ministers in our home first and foremost. And then as we go out into the community, whatever we do, you know, Jesus said, whatever you do, do it under the Lord, whether you're dealing with your family in the morning or having breakfast or with your employees, uh, that's what we are called to do as followers of Christ is, is, you know, to, you know, it has to start at home. 
And in an organization, I've always, you, you know, a lot of people have the CEO at the top and then you have the president and the vice president and then all the structure, right? You got that corporate pyramid. Yeah. I've always flipped that upside down, right? Where the CEO is at the bottom. So if you're a true follower, you know, a true disciple of Christ, as we're called to be, the, 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 the leader of the group is the servant, you know, so I have to give everybody in my organization everything they need to be successful, you know, so my ministry and business is I'm going to be a servant leader, and I'm going to be here to take care of everything and everybody in my organization and give them what they need, you know, tools, training, system support, clear direction, you know, all those types of things in the business, but in their life as well. I'm going to be genuinely, genuinely interested in the people that I'm working with and working around, whether they're in my organization or trade partners out there in the community or, you know, banking partners, closing attorneys, whatever it is involved in the whole process of the transaction. We are leaders, your leader in your house, in your community, in your business. Everybody is leading somebody somewhere, no matter where you're at in your life. There's people that you are called to lead. So when you flip that pyramid upside down and realize, man, I'm, I'm here to serve and that's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm called to do. Then it helps put ministry more in, in perspective because as ministers, that's what you are called to do is serve others. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to be a 24 seven you know, preacher and evangelist to right. be a minister. So that's a great point. You know, in my, my preacher did a um, sermon a couple of weeks ago and, and I've heard it a lot and a lot of Christians have heard it, but as, we, as I've started getting into this and, and really looking at kind of what you're talking about, the, the mental perception, the difference between being a steward, you know, what God has given to us, our time, our talent, our resources, our abilities versus an owner who has the rights to do certain things. Right. And as a Christian, we're all supposed to be stewards. But what happens is, and even in my own life, and I'm sure at times in yours and others, is all of a sudden we want to own this, and then we start doing it our way. And our way normally goes to, you know, what can it get me? Money or position or fame or prestige, you know, that pride comes in, greed comes in. And so if we're really careful to say, hey, I'm going to put others in front of me, and that's a great point you made, because if you want a better relationship with your spouse or better relationship with your kids or better relationship with your employees or your vendors or any anybody in your life, if you want a better relationship with them, it is really simple. Now, it's hard to do, but it's really simple. Put them in right. front of you. Put their needs first. Meet their needs. Then they'll meet yours. I mean, you look at the Chick-fil-A model or the Hobby Lobby model, and I hear you know business journals all the time and in podcasts and other what's the success behind their model i can tell you what the success is they've done what you've done in your business they flipped it and said hey let's take care of everybody else before we take care of ourselves right well yeah and when you whenever you do something if you ask yourself first why am i doing this and who am i doing this for and then it really is easy to hit home now i'm not preaching i'm not saying hey i'm perfect i'm you know like you like we've talked about i've made a lot of mistakes you know i've had very heated conversations with people in business where, and to your point, usually after that, if that has happened, I will call that person back and I'll say, you know what? I apologize. That's not me. I should have never spoken to you that way. And it, it's when, you know, things get heated and it can get a little personal. And when I was younger, I, had, I, you know, I was a fighter, right? So I've learned to be better about that. And I've learned to recognize when that thing wells up in me to just kind of take a breath, take a step back and just let it go, right? And how to win friends and influence people is a great book, right? Let you know what the, you know what the cure to that losing your temper is, and I, I do. I've done this, so I'm really careful. If the next time you lose your temper, or anybody who's listening to this loses your temper, if you will make yourself go to that person face to face and apologize without a but, no excuses. I'm sorry, I lost my cool. You know what you'll do next time? It's so embarrassing. You know what you'll do next time before you lose your temper? If you commit, I'm not, if I say something I shouldn't, or I have a bad attitude, or I lose my temper, I'm immediately going to go apologize. If you can get to him face to face, if not, you know, phone. Brother, it has like not cured me, but it <laughs> sure does make me think really hard about it. You better make sure it's a big battle, right? <laughs> right. Well, because of the embarrassment. If you go to someone, if I, you know, if I, if you and I got into an argument and I came back to you and said, Greg, you know, I'm sorry, man. I, I lost my cool. I shouldn't have done that. And I hope you will forgive me. 
and not say, but you know, the reason I lost my cool is because you were a, and it you can't do that. If you just stop right there at it was, I take responsibility for my actions. The next time that scenario comes up with somebody, you're really hesitant on doing that because that's hard to go to someone and take your responsibility, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great technique and a great point because it's easy to pick up the phone and say, "Hey, man, sorry, I shouldn't," you know. But yeah, when you're standing face to face, looking each other in the eye, uh, it's it's a whole different can of worms. And most of the stuff I'm talking about is just stupid things, like somebody didn't show up when they were supposed to, and and yeah. they're making excuses, and you just get tired of hearing it after the third day, and you're like, "Look, you know." And uh, you, you know, know where my biggest problem is these days: the racquetball court. Because yeah. I'm competitive, <laughs> and I'm like, "You're in my way," you know. You get and all of a sudden, I'm like. I got to watch my testimony. So you're the and, guy whacking, whacking me in the butt with the ball to get me out of the way, aren't you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that you know, hurts. It, you know, and it hurts. So and it, and it makes this feeling of that, you know, where you get red faced or the blood comes up and you just, you know, you're ready. You have every right from an earthly standpoint to just burn fire, burn bridges yeah. and, and just destroy. But like you said earlier, from a, a eternal side, what do we do? What do we have to do? Right. And it's a choice. It's a, mental be, cho it's a mental choice. Right. And you know, you're out there in fellowship, enjoying yourself, getting exercise, right? You should be, you know, a happy camper, right? But yet that thing wells up in you. And, yeah. you know, with me, it's not so much that kind of stuff. It's, it's more, um, you, you know, uh, you get cut off in traffic and or somebody almost causes an accident or something like that. I mean, those are the things today. I'm, Somebody's 15 minutes late for a meeting. Exactly. And you find yourself getting mad. And why are you getting mad? You know, well, I'm offended. You know, my, you know, it's just, it's silliness. Right. And, uh, but it's a daily struggle. And, you know, that's the problem with our faith is that, uh, you know, we're not our faith, but, but with the viewpoint of our faith is people say, oh, well, you claim to be a Christian, but you're this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, you know, um, I'm human and, uh, you know, we are not perfect. There's only been one and we follow him and I'm going to make mistakes. And I'm not saying just because I'm a Christian that, you know, I'm better than you or this or that. I'm just saying these are the principles by which I operate by that are important to me that I want to conduct myself in my life. Sure. I'm going to make mistakes. And, and, you know, unfortunately um, there's a lot of people that abuse that for position and for gain, you know, the, the Christian faith. Right. And, you know, a great analogy that somebody used, used for me. So if there's anybody out there that's listening and saying, you know, I mean, this, this whole faith thing, I, I, you know, I know so many people that are hypocrites or they're just taking money from people or they're just using it and abusing it and whatever the Catholic priest situation, all these things are going on. Right. You know, um, Jesus said there will be false prophets and that we need to beware. Right. He does say that they are going to be false prophets. There's going to be sheep's and wolves clothing. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to know that that's out there. And we need to be able to know the truth. And the only way to know the truth is to read, you know, especially Jesus's words, read the gospels, you know, read, read what Jesus said, what he commanded us to do. And understand if, um, you know, if, if you're in business and I'm giving you counterfeit bills all the time, hundred dollar bills, right. And they're all counterfeit and they're fake. And, and, you know, that's all you've received. And all of a sudden I come along and I give you a hundred dollar bill. Does that mean you're not going to take it? Right. Yeah, what are you, are you just going to leave it there? Right. No, you're going to take it. Exactly. You know, because, you know, at some point it's going to be real, right? The real thing is going to come along. So, you know, when I give you that real hundred dollar bill, even though everything before that was fake, you, you're going to keep it. You're not going to throw it away. Yes. So, you know, faith can be kind of the same way just because there's pretenders out there and there's those of us that are less than perfect and people that abuse the, the Christian faith for personal gain. Don't let that stop you or fool you. Just be aware that that's out there and that that's just how it is. And, you know, we all have to find our own place in faith and we all have to work out our own salvation, right? With fear and trembling, meaning, you know, we need to be aware of our own selves. God knows our heart. He knows our true intentions, right? We're not fooling anybody, uh, especially ourselves. So when you take that personally and you try to live that out every day, it really does change you. And I've seen lives transformed, including my own. And, uh, and, and it's made a big deal. Even though I can't be perfect, I have the desire to be. Exactly. That's you the be real Christ -like. difference. You're, trying, you're striving to be Christ-like. That's the real difference. I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to slip up. The bottom line is my heart is, my intentions are to be more like Christ in every way. Yeah. I can't do it. None of us can do it. We never will. The world is not made that way. That's why we need Christ. That's why we needed a Savior. But as long as my intentions come from that perspective, 
then that's the game changer right so you you make a a very valid point there that sometimes and even people in church not just catholic pre i mean baptist methodist press you know any church is that that building even those who are saved they're still hypocrites they're still liars they're still cheats they're still mean they're you name it just because you're saved all of a sudden doesn't mean that all the things that you struggle with are gone. And so as someone who's looking at, is that for me, you know, I'm, I'm saved, do I, but do I get back into the church or do I get back into a relationship with God or I'm unsaved and man, those Christians were mean to me. You know, listen, I tell people I, I'm a hypocrite. I try not to, but I'm a hypocrite at times. A lot of times I, I say, I'm going to serve the Lord and then I struggle with it. So if you're struggling with that of like, what's that group about over there? Hey, you know what? Those are a bunch of people who are sinners, who are saved by the grace of God, who have their struggles too, just like you do. And so when you start looking at it from that perspective, you can start to understand that, yes, they have their problems, but I have mine too. But at least they're trying, they're striving to serve the Lord. Yep, exactly. And, uh, you know, and that was, you know, the whole Catholic thing is just in the headlines and I don't, oh, yeah. I don't yeah. have anything, you know, denominational. I'm just a non-denominational guy, but it's in every faith. It's in every, you know, uh, secular organization. The Boy Scouts went through their whole thing, right? So, I mean, it, it's uh, evil is rampant. This, this world has evil. There are evil and darkness and forces out there that are out to, you know, take, to, to destroy our soul, right? The Bible says that they're you know, that Satan's out there like a lying, seeking to, you know, steal and destroy, right? Our joy, um, our faith, you know, that's, that's what makes them happy. But we've been given uh, a way out and a way through. We've been given Christ, you know, as a sacrifice for us. And a lot of people understand, they hear that cliche stuff, right? God was given as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. You know, what does that really mean? And, yeah. and you know, at the end of the day, what it means is we, we are in this world. We, we live in the flesh, right? But it doesn't mean that we are bound to that, right? So those that that's been done for us. And as believers, when you decide to believe in Christ, what a lot of people don't understand, it's not necessarily about the kingdom to come or the afterlife. You are forever alive today. When you receive Christ and when you receive the forgiveness of Christ and you believe in the kingdom and you surrender and you believe in Christ, and you accept Christ as your Lord. Well, you're, you live forever from today on. Eternal yeah. life begins today. From the day that you accept Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior, that's when eternal life begins. So that's when I talk about the eternal perspective. So from that standpoint, does it really matter? I mean, I'm going to live forever. Does any of this, you know, dated to somebody cuts me off in traffic? So what? You know, there's there's a line at the grocery store and somebody's, you know, cashier is really slow. You know, why are we sitting there tapping our foot, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. pick somebody out in line, enjoy the circumstance like racquetball, you know, uh, why are we getting mad because we're losing or somebody's in it, whatever, you know, have fun, enjoy the camaraderie, enjoy the time. And, you know, man, thank God you can even play, right? Because there's people that can't even move a limb. And, um, you know, so when you start thinking about things like that, from that perspective, it, it can help ground you a it little can really, bit, but you really change things. It can, but it's hard. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's a tough world and we were promised that there would be challenges and there are going to be difficulties and we're going to face trials. You are guaranteed in your life you're going to face something that you never ever could have imagined could happen. Whether yeah. you lose everything you have, whether you lose somebody very close to you, whether, uh, you, you know, whatever it is, every single one of us are going to face something in our lives that we never ever thought could ever happen, never imagined, never signed up for. And when that does happen, where are you going to turn? I guess that's really what it boils down to. Right. And so, you know, if you're in that position, right, if you're struggling with that, you know, yes, get into God's word. Yes, develop your prayer life, but also seek out counsel. Find someone who you can talk with that you don't feel like they're judging you or don't feel like they're going to tell everyone about your struggles. Go sit down and talk with someone. Hey, so, Greg, switching gears here. Yeah. What would you say to the person who says, you know, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I've got you know, my religion over here, but I'm going to keep my faith and my business separated. Because at one time, every, every person I know, I did it for a long time. I'm still a faithful person, but I wasn't the, I wasn't combining the principles of God's word necessarily with my business. What would you say to them of 
to address that argument that they have. Right. So that's the, you know, it's just business. It's not personal, right? That's the conversation, you know, so all bets are off. It's just business. Whereas over here, I'm the deacon in your church and I'm going to shake your hand and pat you on the back. But over here, man, I'm going to skin you alive if you don't cover your, if you don't cover yourself, right? In business, it's caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. You need to do your due diligence or I'm going to take advantage. And hey, it's just business. Well, it's a relational, business is relational. It's all about relationships. It's all about people. If you truly profess Christ in your life and you are truly a father follower of Christ, there is no separation of personal and business. It, you are a, you're, you're a child of God and so is everybody else, right? And we, we are called to be the same whether it's business, whether it's personal. Now, that's one context. The other context is, well, am I supposed to, in every business situation, you know, share my faith and evangelize and do all those things? And, you know, I'm not saying that, that you're necessarily called to do that. But what I'm saying is, is Jesus said, hey, you know, whoever uh, professes to know me, I will profess to know you when the time comes, right? And whoever denies me, I'm going to deny you. So um, I don't, I'm not in your face with people, but I do let people know, Hey, I'm a person of faith. I believe in Christ. I'm a Christian. This is how I operate and conduct myself. It, you know, I don't just like start it out that way. Hey, I'm Greg and I'm a Christian and you know, welcome. Good to meet you. It, it comes out in every conversation I have in business. It just comes out that I'm a person of faith. I believe in Christ. I operate my company with, you know, biblical principles. And, uh, and I try to do the best I can do to be a great representative of Christ. And I, I, I put that out there and I've always kind of walked that way. And I've always kind of intertwined the two. It has never cost me. It has never hurt me. It's never been a problem on the, on the same level. And I've offered myself out to my people and, you know, that I work with and stuff as a, as a, you know, help to them, you know, if they wanted to talk about anything or need anything. Now on the other side of that, I don't go out and I don't forcefully put it in anybody's face or anybody's face, you know? Uh, I'm just there. I do. I do let people know that that's how I'm wired and that's what I believe in. And those are my beliefs. And, and I respect whatever else anybody else's beliefs are. And, you know, Hey, if somebody's, you know, a different faith or a different religion or whatever, it doesn't stop me from doing business with them. Uh, but I sure will have some discussions with them. And I've had, you know, Jehovah's witnesses and Mormons and, you know, Jewish and Catholic and uh, Muslim and just, you know, every other faith really uh, I do business with on a daily basis. Charlottesville is a very culturally ethnic community very diverse community and you have all kinds of beliefs and religions and races and everybody here. So we have some really good discussions and I I enjoy those discussions every day in my business. I have faith discussions at a very deep level with people of all different faiths. The one thing we are called is to be able to give an answer for the hope that we have in our heart, but to do it with gentleness and with respect. So one thing I would tell anybody and everybody listening that's in a business situation or, or whatever, that there is no difference. You can't separate business and personal. You just can't. It's all personal, every bit of it. And just remember those words that you are, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you are commanded in the Bible to be able to give an answer for that hope that you have, for that belief that you have, but with gentleness and with respect. And some of the greatest apologists in the world, uh, Ravi Zacharias and, and his organization, very humble, very gentle people that have educated themselves and that know how to sit down and explain why they believe what they believe. Right. But in, and they don't do it in an offensive way. They don't do it in a, you know, judgmental way. Right. And, you know, kind of the point you were saying there in that uh, of doing business with basically anyone. You know, my perspective on it is if if someone doesn't want to do business with me because I'm an evangelical Christian and I'm not a Bible thumper, I'm not out like, oh, you know, hey, here's your, you know, here's your contract and here's your Bible. You know, I'm not that. But. I look at it kind of as, well, you know, if somebody doesn't want to do business with me because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it won't be long before there's something else wrong in that relationship. Absolutely. And for me, I know what it's done in my own life. I know what it's done in the lives of others around me. I've seen it transform lives over and over again. And, you know, for me, it took this young kid who was just thought he just had the tiger by the tail and just, you know, was out there and don't you tell me how to do something and you're not going to get over on me. And I was ready to, you know, I was ready to stand my ground at any minute. It turned me into somebody who had a much gentler heart, who was genuinely concerned about others and what they were going through. And, and it, and it really until, and again, my life was going great. You know, I didn't have a Damascus road experience, right? I, everything was perfect. 
but I still had that edge. I still had that intensity and I'm an intense person, right? I, you know, to do $200 million in deals and start 12 companies and just do the things that I do, you know, you have to be intense. You have to be demanding. You got to be a driver. You got to be able to get things done. That's just my personality and my DNA. I'm a leader, you know, delegator, motivator. You have to hold people accountable, but there is a way to do it with gentleness and kindness and love and sincerity. And I've seen, you know, I've seen that transform in my heart and in my life and what it did for me. And that's, that's how I express the hope that I have in my heart. It's just what I've experienced personally, what I've seen others experience. And when you study, you know, and read the Bible every day, and when you cultivate your relationship with, with God and with Christ, the desires of your heart change, right? So, so there is a scripture that says, commit your ways to him and he will give you the desires of your heart. A lot of people, the, you know, look at that and think of that as uh, almost, you know, almost it's like an ATM, right? Well, if I just follow God, he's going to give me all the money I want. That's not really what it means. What it means is when you decide to become a follower of Christ, the desires of your heart are going to change. And that's what he's going to give you. And you will desire the things of the eternal life and the treasures of heaven, not the things of this earth. And again, nothing wrong with success and making money and those types of things. You know, we are actually called to do that. If we have talents, we're supposed to use them, right? And we are supposed to do what we do to the fullest. And, and like we're like God is our boss all day, every day. Jesus is sitting right next to me going, all right, man, I gave you this. What are you going to do with it? Right. So, um, you know, that's kind of how I roll through the day. You know, I've got I've got God and Christ right there with me all day long and uh, everything I do. All right. What, you know, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to handle that? Where are we going next? And and the flip side to that is I've given you this opportunity. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. That's an excellent point. So let's do a quick speed round here. And I really yeah. appreciate your, your time today. You've given a lot of good points, a lot of good you know, illustrations and things that people can take and apply to their lives. You know, being a Christian is not a complicated thing. We make it complicated. So let me ask you a few quick questions here on the speed round. What's right. the most valuable piece of information that you could give someone that's around your industry, the, the, area that you're involved with and it could be one or two if you like the most valuable piece of information in, in my industry um i guess it's that whatever it is that uh, that you want to do you know i get a lot of questions on people how do i do bigger deals right that's what i really help a lot of people do is scale their business and do bigger deals is don't be limited by your own thinking whatever it is you want to do there's a way to make it happen and you can do it the money's out there it's a very capital rich environment right now so there's a lot of capital chasing deals so don't be held back by the mindset of, well, I can only do this size deal or I can only do that size transaction. Um, you can do much bigger than you ever, ever thought you could. And there's help out there and there's capital out there chasing deals. That's all. I like that. If you could give yourself, your younger self, one piece of advice, what would it be? Start big and forget the building business. <laughs> Just go, go straight to the developer role and start with big projects. Or uh, big I, projects. Didn't, I didn't yeah. know that I could have done that back then. Right. Yeah. And that, and that, and that's good. You know, have that plan, right? Maybe you have to start where you are, but don't box God in. Yeah, exactly. We often do. I do that. I'm like, Oh, I can do this. I'm like, well, I mean, I can do this, but God can do this. Right. Um, what's the best book you've read recently that you would recommend to folks? Uh, one of the best books that I recently read uh, was um, Happiness by Harry Edelson. Um, Harry Edelson is, was one time one of the most quoted guys on Wall Street, and he wrote a book on happiness. And uh, he is the founder of, I think he's had 20 unicorns, which is he's a venture capitalist. And uh, that's a business that was either valued at or sold at a billion dollars. And he's had about, who know, he's had 12 of them. He's on his 13th. And uh really neat guy, Harry Edelson, look him up. He's got some, some video out there and, and uh, some podcasts out there that he's done, but just a super happy guy. That's just talks about how to be fulfilled and happy in your life, no matter what's going on. Really, really good book. And then principles by Ray Dalio. That's a really good book. As well. Okay. And I would say probably in his book, his key to happiness is not money. Correct. Exactly. He doesn't even talk about that at all. Yep. So what's the best way for people to find you or find you online or get in touch with you? So gregdickerson.com. All my contact info is on there. Greg at gregdickerson.com. Greg at gregdickerson.com is my email, 434-326-3903. It's my cell phone. I answer it. 
Uh, I have no backlog in my life, which is one of the things that Harry talks about. I take care of everything right away and I outsource, I delegate, I lead, motivate. So uh, I, I own my time. I have great bandwidth. I've got a lot of projects going on and uh, but I'm still able to pick up the phone and answer it because of the way I operate. I outsource and leverage, um, you know, technology and assets of others. And, uh, and I lead and delegate teams. So it gives me the ability to help others pour into others and, and own my time. So gregdickerson.com, uh, that's where all my info is. Perfect. And what's the type of deal or deals are you looking for that if someone has something that they could bring to you? Bigger deals, 20 million and up, uh, you know, it's kind of the world that I play in, whether it's a ground up development uh, multifamily, um, doing some hotel projects, uh, things like that, or if it's a uh, value add or even stabilized asset trading at a good cap rate. Uh, but typically the bigger deals, I like to be in that, you know, $20 million range, plus or minus up to about the $50 million range. That's kind of where, where we're at right now. Yeah. And opportunity zones, right? I do focus on opportunity zones right now. Yes. We, we, there's a lot of capital chasing those. That would be one tip for people in the industry. If you don't know about opportunity zones, go ahead and research that and take a look at it. There's a lot of capital looking, looking to place in those, uh, in those areas. Awesome. Well, Greg, I really appreciate your time today. I really appreciate the, the wisdom and the guidance that you've uh, given to us and sharing your story. And uh, I look forward to getting to know you better. And I look forward to people getting to know you better. And I pray the Lord continues to bless you and use you for the betterment of his kingdom. Amen. Thank you. And I enjoyed the time, Nathan. And thank you for what you do. I mean, it's very encouraging and just, it's awesome that you have a podcast focused on faith and how to incorporate that in your business. That's just, that's just really great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.